UNO has always been an expanding university, constantly moving forward. But as we move forward, we must also look back to where we began. Let's go back in time with the people who remember UNO the way it was. Join us for Reflections in Time. It's the spring of 1988. It's a beautiful day here in Omaha, and we're situated in the beautiful, quite new Health, Physical Education, Recreation Faculty Lounge, where we do a lot of the programs that we've come to call Reflections in Time. For a number of years now, I've been involved with this, and with 40 to, oh, actually it's over 50 people, really, who've sat down with me and visited, visited about their, their past, university as they've known it over the years, the many, many years usually, that they have been involved. And that's the case today as we put another one into the locker, so to speak. These tapes are being housed at the Alumni House and over in our university library. And today we have a man with us who is a great, very creative person who's been with us as a teacher and an artist for a lot of years, actually over 30. Peter, I've known you for all of those years, but I don't believe other than that you're from Detroit. I know much about your background. You did come from Detroit. <laughs> I uh, spent my whole childhood there, and all my uh, schooling was in Michigan. Where did you, uh, you go to school uh, beyond high school? Where did you oh, go Albion, to college? Too? Albion College oh, in Albion, Michigan, between Jackson and yeah. Battle Creek. Cornflakes and the world's largest state prison. Out of a family that, <laughs> out of a family that were college people, or were you the first one to go? How did you end up going to college? Lots of people, 30, 40 years ago, didn't go to college. You know. Well, I uh, was college bound, almost from the beginning. My family uh, was there was no question about it. My father was a Harvard man, mm -hmm. and my mother. Uh, was one uh, hour shy of graduating from uh, high school, but went on to art school in both Boston and uh, and New York. And uh, there was never any question about the fact I go into college. Now, uh, the art end of it, there was uh, never any question, but uh, there was also um, not much of an indication early on. Uh -huh. So you were uh, telling me as we were sitting getting ready to do this tape that that you're undergraduate training really wasn't in the area of art, right? That's right. It was economics. Well, that was my major. all get squared around. Uh, what were you going to be, Pete, back uh, in those days? At, um, yeah, well, it's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, even then, in my uh, junior year, when I decided I would uh, abandon economics in a way for art for the last semester, and I ended up with two majors anyway. Uh, the reason I did that is because I uh, had pretty well fulfilled all the requirements for um, the economics degree, and I had a lot of art. And I didn't want to take the kind of economics that was still available. So I uh, wound out my senior year uh, majoring in art, becoming more fascinated with it all the time. And, was your uh, mother's background an interest in it, uh, an encouragement in that? Uh, you mentioned that she was... In a way, yeah. I think so, yeah. I used to play hooky from uh, choir practice at, in Detroit and go to the Detroit Art Institute. <laughs> And uh, we and sometimes I'd, I'd even uh, cut out on Sunday. The museum was open, so I could escape. I went to a church down in a, on Woodward Avenue, and uh, it was almost downtown Detroit. Uh -huh. And uh, the Art Institute and the Public Library were adjacent to each other, and you could go to either place on Sunday morning. So if I didn't feel like going to church and uh, sing in the choir, I used to skip out. <laughs> And that's a lot of the art interest started there, especially uh, the ancient world. I really enjoyed that, and that, that interest has uh, been going on for a long time. Well, anyway, the, the reason I could do that art business, and too, is I could waive the language requirement because of high school I had my four years of, uh, of Latin. So it, it, it freed up about 12 hours. So oh. one thing or another, you started into the field of art really when you were about a, really into it, when you were about a junior in college, really. That's right. That's right. Okay, you finished college, Peter, and then what happened? I went to graduate school. Where at? Cranbrook, oh. which is right outside of Detroit. Uh -huh. So I was kind of lucky enough to have uh, the Harvard of Art Schools no, right in my backyard. Yeah. Now, uh, 
what kind of tack did you take at the graduate level? What area of interest you mentioned early art you were interested in as a, as a boy and as, as a looker and that sort of thing. Now, when you got into it more fully, what did you aspire to? Painting. Uh -huh. Painting and a design minor. Mm -hmm. And in those days you had to take a minor, which was Friday, and then four days a week you painted. And you had a few other requirements. One of them was anatomy, uh, that it was more like a kinesiology course. Mm -hmm. You ended up having to learn the origins, insertion, and function of all the muscles and uh, their Latin so names. Well, that's what they, they taught at about that time. All the sculptors, all the painters had to do this, even though we were all smearing all over the mm -hmm. canvas mm -hmm. and weren't paying any attention to uh, uh, any real representational subjects. In those days, uh, Pollock and uh, Franz Klein, the abstract expressionist, de Kooning and Gorky were all. So you're probably scratching your head. Why am I doing this? Huh? Well, no, we didn't. Curriculum. Not in those days. We just did what we were told. <laughs> it was part of it. And then there was a philosophy course we had to attend, eight weeks each year, and uh, for no credit. These both of these things were no credit necessarily. You had to pass them though. The philosophy course, you had your presence was all that was necessary. They never tested us artists on on things like philosophy because I don't think you they'd probably. People, you don't have to do that. Well, we'd probably come up with about ten different answers. You see, <laughs> so they wonder what on earth they were talking about. How long were you at this uh, graduate program? Then? I was there for 18 months, uh -huh. and it's generally a two-year degree, and I have a feeling because I didn't take up dorm space or more, more than an 8 by 10 foot area, they decided, well, what the heck, I'll let him leave a little early. <laughs> and, uh, and I really uh, uh, would have stayed uh, the full time. It was quite a place to be. It's like being at Versailles. Now, a personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, by this time, were you a married man, or were you heading in that direction? Uh, heading in that direction, I met my wife at Albion College. Did you? Undergraduate? Uh, yeah, and she was um, 17, uh -huh. and I was too old. And you were too old at 20? I was 20. Why? Well, she thought I was too old. Sure. I was, I was uh, <laughs> and she was going to be 18 in November, so uh, uh, when she got to be 18, I think I dated her once. And then uh, we didn't date again for quite a while. And uh, by the time she was a sophomore, and I was a senior at the time. Now that you mentioned it, Peter, I think there was a long way from 17 to 20. Well, oh. according to her mother, that was the way that was. She was told uh, that us older guys were dangerous, I suppose. Well, we're, we're Regardless of that, uh, love blossomed and... Well, uh, uh, that's right. She left Albion in her sophomore year when I went to graduate school. She went to the University of Michigan. And uh, that's about 30 miles from Cranbrook, which made it a little easier uh, to keep up our, our correspondence. And then uh, we did get married. And uh, I uh, moved to Ann Arbor for a little while and lived there and uh, still worked in Detroit. I was an accountant. Well, during, during graduate school. You were an accountant. Well, there your economic background. That's, play that's right. I didn't want to waste anything. This is why I'm hearing an artist talk about being an accountant. That's not well, too usual, I wouldn't say. Um, <laughs> no, most of them, artists that I know, adding and subtracting, dividing is tough. Didn't work out it's tough work. for them. <laughs> I was um, a service accountant for a Caterpillar tractor uh, dealership. And my main job there was to keep track of uh, international salts purchases of tractors. And they would buy them and then take them apart. Yeah. And they would put them down in the pit in pieces and then they had to put them back together. So the, uh, the end of the product was a cost for a tractor that was probably three times what they had to spend. Because putting them back together is more expensive, more expensive than, 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 than having them put, uh, you know, and they couldn't buy them in pieces. <laughs> so they, but anyway, that, that was fun time. How long did you work at that? Well, all during graduate school. I would, uh, I'd go to work at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and, and be out at noon. And then I go to graduate school and work. My life was really on a kind of a funny track. And then I'd, I'd eat lunch in the car, somewhat like I do now. I mean, I don't eat lunch in the car, but I'm always walking and eat lunch. And uh, start uh, working on my paintings about 1 o'clock, and I work up to about 7, 8 o'clock at night. I come home, I eat with my dad. My mom taught in public schools there in mm -hmm. adult education. And then um, I would... Uh, 
return uh, to graduate. Uh, I mean, to work in the morning, eight o'clock to twelve, one o'clock to eight, eat, go to bed, and then that would go on for five days, and then I'd split for Ann Arbor. Was it a little hard to be creative in terms of all the painting you were trying to do and do all this other stuff too? I see you'd be exhausted. Uh, not really, no, no. The routine. Really, yeah, no, no. The, uh, the more I did, the better off I was. Yeah. The same at that time. I mean, that's not true now. <laughs> Now we're getting a little closer toward that, but uh, what time did uh, this place, as a University of Omaha, I imagine it was called then, pop into your life? It it was really kind of strange. I was you hadn't heard of it during the years you're describing. No, no. Uh, I had sent out about uh, 300 resumes. A uh, typical resume of a person my age uh, was just going to school and the courses you took, you know, and whatever honors you could garner, and uh, the uh, degrees. And, you know things you had, and uh, wasn't getting much uh, uh, luck at all. So I s turned it all over to a, to an employment bureau out of Chicago, American College Bureau, and it was uh, something that Dr. Bale had used, I guess, to hire faculty. Mm -hmm. And we got a call. And I was ready to go anyway because it was June, and uh, I had already had my degree since uh, January. And Jody was just finishing her degree at the University of Michigan. Did you people have been married by this time? We were married, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, we had some job leads in Texas, the TCU and a place called Arlington State, which is the University of Texas Arlington now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were scheduled for uh, interviewing in July. So we weren't, you know, we were ready, but we weren't ready yet. We were going to just pack up and take off with the idea that we wanted to uh, to leave anyway, uh, Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, see what, uh, seek our fortune, if you yeah. will, yeah, with a bank of gold. Like, in you the know, real middle you know. of it. Yes, that's right. Well, anyway, we got a call, and Bale had uh, uh, talked to my mother, and she called and related the message that we had to be out here in two days. And that was late. Jody called her brother in Adrian, Michigan, and they came up to Ann Arbor and packed the trailer, and uh, we started out with this trailer what in year was this 1958 uh -huh. and uh, my 57 Chevy Nomad which I wish I still had put that on the record uh, <laughs> which I don't it was a nice nice car and uh, with this big trailer in the back a U-Haul you know and we were charging down the road and we did get here in time for the interview Dr. Blackwell was here being interviewed at the same time let me ask you let's pause right there Peter you, you came from the Detroit area big metropolitan area yeah where you lived most of your life, all your life pretty much. Here you came into, out to the Middle West a little farther. What were your first impressions of uh, Omaha and then maybe of University, at that well, time, which is certainly different? Oh, right. I got lost in Elmwood Park. <laughs> we, for some reason, I didn't come up Dodge, and uh, we got stuck in, uh, on, it must have been on Leavenworth or someplace. Uh, and we came into the park and was circling around and around, couldn't find our way out. And it was dark time. Oh, it was dark time. You see, that was late at night, and then because we had that interview the next morning, and we went started charging our dots trying to find a place to be, and we were in some flea bag uh, motel right out about 114th. There's trailer park there, and there's nothing there right now yeah, except I that. well, there is a big bank there right now, but it was literally nothing at out of town. Really. It was out of town. Yeah, maybe it wasn't even that far. Maybe it was 132nd. I don't know, 114th, 132nd. Well, anyway, it, it was. Uh, uh, tired time. In those days, the Iowa roads, you know, had curbs on them. You bet. And they, weren't, they weren't very wide. And they weren't very wide, and that name trailer went up on the curb, and we were, we were just rocking, rocking, around. rocking around. But we, we made, made it. Truck, great stuff. Yeah, we made it. And uh, we came in, and uh, as far as my impression of Omaha, it didn't take long to get through it. Not no. compared to Detroit. <laughs> uh, except we did get, as I say, lost. We didn't know what we were doing. And. Uh, the first impression of the university is whether it was a nice looking campus. We were very impressed by this the stand of pines that's still there on the east side. And coming into the campus, uh, it was uh, in June, things hadn't burned out yet, and uh, it was a very uh, exciting time for but us. But all these buildings weren't here. Oh no, nothing, mm -hmm. hardly. The field house, right. the Epley Library, and uh, and the administration building, for which is Arts and Science Hall. Yeah, for those watching yeah. this tape, when you say Epley Library, they think of it now in the 60s, 80s, and 90s as 
the Epley Building for administration. That's right. The library. Even. All the administration was in the, uh, which is now Arts and Science Hall. Dr. Bale was right below us in the art department, which was right. probably kind of a exciting time for him because we used to make a lot of noise up there. <laughs> and you creative people. Yeah. Now, you mentioned it in two or three times, and that's where you came here because he asked you to come and visit with him. How about uh, your first impressions of people on this camp? The first person I suppose you really met was probably Dr. Bale. That's right, and uh, Thelma Engel was his part-time secretary then. Yes because uh, his regular, Mrs. Spangler, mm -hmm. she was on vacation. And Thelma was, uh, uh, wasn't a typist, you know. And she had to type these contracts for us. This is after I got the job. Even though we, we felt that we were, I, I really wasn't very interested in Texas, uh, really, uh, for several reasons. Uh, but we, at, at that particular time in Michigan, in 58, we were in recession. Uh, it hadn't touched Omaha, it seemed. We, we were quite uh, pleased and uh, rather bewildered because Omaha had, was not experiencing the same problems that I Michigan was. Maybe you're answering in part now, but why you yeah. stayed? Well, you were sort of on your way to Texas in a way, but you started to come here and look. Well, there were several what things. Um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, didn't interest me, I think. And, and Omaha, uh, uh, what you might call the upper Midwest uh, was it more interesting at the time and uh, and well the job market here was paying about uh, $1,200 more a year it was yeah the salary here was something like 46 and those Texas salaries were 34 and 32 well now the art department as you and Jody came here was kind of small wasn't it that's right we were two and a half people who were the two and a half people well it was Vic Vic Blackwell and me and Jane Anderson, who was half a person. You remember Jane? Yes, I do. Well, the reason she was half time is that she was working with the education college, yeah. and at that time, student supervision of art students was held in the education college. And then she taught the art ed courses. Or it may have been the other way around. But nevertheless, she was only half a half half an FTE, we called them, remember, the full time oh, equivalent. equivalent. You bet. And Jane, uh, we finally got her over, though. Full time, and then we had a lot of part time people. Steve Pulcher, who was working at Boys Town, was teaching ceramics and sculpture. Uh, there were several others that I uh, that were here just the year before, but they weren't at that time. We we had cleaned the slate. We kept Steve on because he was a good ceramist, and Steve was one of the reasons I got the job. What was it? Doctor Bale was very impressed by Cranbrook people. Oh, okay. At least he was impressed by Steve. I don't know how that would follow necessarily <laughs> but thank goodness for Steve Pulcher because uh, uh, and, and, and the irony of a lot of this is the fact that uh, no one asked me to see my uh, ask see my work even though we went through that Dean's review process you didn't ask to see the you done? not a thing you had it all available? I did I had my slides and I had, I had to force it on I showed Dr. Uh, uh, Thompson uh -huh. Dean yeah. Thompson yeah. and I uh, I showed um who was the adult education? Emory. Emory, Don Emory. Don Emory. But they didn't ask. I could have done anything. Yeah. <laughs> Which was, you know, in those days they didn't question. You could have been an economist instead of I, oh, That's why. I, well, I did have my uh, my degrees, though. I d could prove them. You know, there's a few instances on this campus yeah. where degrees are somewhat suspect. Yeah. Uh, and then the end have, years. yeah. Well, they trusted me. So well, that was nice. As you began, you were. Uh, as a part of that very small two and a half person art department, what was our art program like? Then? What were we doing with and for students at that time, as you recall? Well, we had a BFA degree, and it was a uh, complete program with an incomplete faculty. Uh, we had really no business offering that that degree and almost all the courses the seeds of all the courses were that we have now are there mm -hmm. now uh, subsequently we've done a lot of work in art history uh, adding courses uh, and breaking up courses uh, we might be r running uh, for instance survey was one semester we'd run from the cave paintings through the contemporary or the modern uh, in one course well there's no way 
could handle that sort of no. thing. You you would, I mean, you go three thousand years in one lecture, <laughs> and uh, in order to cover things properly. Yeah. So anyway, we broke that one up, and then we started busting up the Renaissance into north and south. Uh, the modern used to cover from the 17th century to the present. Well, that was ridiculous. The 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries should have been busted up, and they, they subsequently was done, uh, and. From two and a half faculty, we are now something around uh, 11. Mm -hmm. Were those yeah. young men and women, and older ones if they were Dalit people, uh, were they people who were intending to be artists, or were they in art education mainly? What kinds of people were we getting as students? Being? The mix is just about the same. Uh, there are people intending to be teachers of art. Uh, there were people who wanted to study art seriously. Uh, uh, with the idea of going on for advanced degrees. That's the kind of thing we encourage. Mm -hmm. um, they were old, young, uh, people coming back to school. Same, same situation. So that part hasn't really changed. No, I think our mix, and that's one of the, the pluses, I think, here at the university. Uh, for me over the years, mm -hmm. is that you're not dealing with the traditional students uh, in the terms where you go off, you know, say you go into Wesleyan and everybody's, your freshmen are all 18 mm -hmm. or 17, like Jody was when I met her. Sure. Uh, and uh, you get a nice mixture of, of people. Along that line, I was intending, I guess, to ask you a little later in our time together, people, I'll ask it now, the student, and that's the important reason we've been here, are the people we try to work with and to help in various ways. Do you think the students of 1958 and 60 and 61 uh, were much different in their aims and what they were like, let's say, than students in 1989 as we record this program? I never really That's a tough question. Yeah, I never thought about it. Then and now you've hit so many of them, hundreds of them. Um, there have been cycles of, of students. I think right now the student is much like it was when I was first here. They're all kind of uh, uh, searching around, uh, willing to accept a lot of things. Uh, uh, a lot more liberal than they were, let's say, during the, uh, the Vietnam era, where it was kind of a, there was a split in society, as we know. And uh, they were, uh, there was, there were, it was the older, uh, Professors, uh, older teachers, uh, and I was getting older at that time, were not as, uh, there wasn't the respect, and I think they'd been, somehow the young people thought they were being betrayed, or had been betrayed mm. by the system, so to speak, mm -hmm. if you remember those days. And so on this campus, the things were very quiet compared very, to a lot of campuses. Yeah. Uh, the only time I remember here that uh, things got a little hairy was during the, uh, when they went into Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And that was that was the toughest time. I recall we had one sit-in in the president's office or in the hall up there, didn't we? Or yeah, like yeah. But compared to a lot of campuses, well, it was not, not much. But I think what you described sort of like a pendulum. The student now is. Yeah, I mean, the last time. ten years or so, it's been like that. I've, I've been, it's been easier to teach mm -hmm. under those circumstances because people come in and they really listen. One thing you mentioned that I didn't want to leave quite yet, you mentioned that when you came here how small the art department was. Of course, the university was small. And about 6,800, yeah. I think, was the... F yeah. Well, we're double that and more now, yeah. of course, but the art program, you tried to give that Bachelor of Fine Arts, you said, but the small faculty gave a big program. That was true of a lot of other programs on campus, too, wasn't it? We were sort of understaffed, weren't we? I, could, I would think so. I, I really, my own concern was the art department. I, I remember the music department back of the, of this, the field house yeah. and trying to do what they had to do in the, in the mess that that was. <laughs> Can you imagine? And, and those, well, those, those, those rooms, yes. they were temporary. And I imagine the music sounded awful. And, uh, there were a lot of problems, I think. One thing uh, I wanted to spend uh, some time with you on uh, here. A, a lot of people may not know what you've taught on this campus, although you've touched hundreds of lives and thousands of lives of students, but uh, your work is more enduring than much of our work because you are a painter, which you started out to be a lot of years ago. Tell uh, us a little about that part of your life because that's been the other part of your life along with teaching that's consumed much of your time and much of your creative life. Um, how did, has that, has that gone through period? Let's, let's talk about how it really got started for you, Peter. Okay, the, the painting business is, 
is very important to the teaching, I think. My own feeling about it is that uh, if I don't and hadn't kept painting, I wouldn't be a very good teacher. Uh, I would uh, have developed into more of what, what I call art education than I would be, or you would be more the teacher than the artist teacher kind of situation. Well, anyway, uh, there was always the danger of becoming complacent about your uh, your situation, you know, where, where you just teach and painting can be now and again if there's a faculty show. Well, that's that's not what I particularly wanted. Uh, the I paint and do approximately 30 pieces a year. Do you? And uh, this has been an average for you over. Oh, it, that's that's probably a low average. Is that right? When you think about sometimes when I get on a toot, mm -hmm. so to speak, and I might push out uh, uh, during vacations, uh, during times where I got time, I might uh, paint two or three a week. Get it going. Correct. Yeah, I'm into some three-dimensional things now. And I, well, I have a lot of stuff. pattern of your work, has there been a change? Are you, uh, did you do one thing and then something else? Impressionistic work? This, I, th I think it's been an evolution. Now, if you look at a bunch of slides, you have to realize you're dealing with 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I can go through that process sometimes in 45 minutes to half hour, and it looks like I've just changed dramatically from point A to point Z, mm -hmm. the end of the line. Uh, that's not not at all the way I view it. Uh, early on I was very uh, attached to abstract expressionism which is more free uh, schmear painting I call mm -hmm. it. But I'm not a, a dribbler or a dripper uh, but I do I did schmear mm -hmm. and there were a few what I call creative dribbles here and there. But um, uh, happy accidents if we used to call them. Happy, happy accidents. Well anyway um, uh, for first, first about the first ten years here, I was involved in that kind of thing. But by about '78 or so, I started to move away uh, and get into uh, something that I've been very interested in, which is the more hard, hard edge painting, which is the, probably what you're more familiar with than the earlier pieces. Uh, and I changed from oil to acrylic which made it possible for this sort of technique to evolve. Describe the technique in a little more detail for our kids when you say the hard edge. Well, what it is is, uh, uh, well, what I call the mindless method. <laughs> because that's pretty much what it amounts to. It's the outcome of the painting. It's with abstract expressionism is the act of painting that seems to be the more satisfying thing mm -hmm. about the painting uh, while you're doing it, so to speak. Right, well, with my kind of work right now, it's after it's all over. It's the satisfaction comes in. The other is kind of a, 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 a from method. From an point of view. No. Yeah, from an artist's point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, yeah, because obviously when people uh, aren't artists, they look at pictures, they don't realize the process necessarily anyway. But with abstract expressionism, the process is very important for the outcome uh, in terms of the emotional yeah. uh, involvement of the artist. Well, within a hard edge painting, everything is done with straight lines and flat colors. Brush strokes are not in evidence. Uh, I've been tempted from time to time to drift and balance both ideas, but it's not uh, uh, that's not the way it, way it operates. But it's as I say, the the last thing you do, uh, you finally see the picture. Mm -hmm. And I use masking tape in my work and uh, try to figure out all the different ways masking tape can can uh, can make for something that's very personal, which is sometimes a little hard because it's a very mechanical process where you're sitting around waiting for things to dry. Yeah. But in Does a, the mechanics of painting get in the way of the feelings that you're having or trying to create because of the time frame you're working in? Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm, yeah, no, because I know pretty much what I want to do. Uh -huh. and, uh, Has it always been that way or did this come after years? Of well, that's years, years and years of stuff. I, uh, of working out problems and color ideas and compositions. When I you know, I want to ask you this, Peter, as a person who's enjoyed or not that I've understood a lot of it, but I can enjoy it. And that's the thing about music and art. You can enjoy all these art forms, even if you don't know a lot. Yeah. I was wondering, just from the time you have an idea or a feeling, till I can see it down at Jocelyn, as I have seen your work and hundreds of other people's, uh, the process, you mentioned the process a while ago. What kind of a process does Peter go through to create one of those 
30 pings that you described here a while ago. Well, I mean, is, are there steps that always occur usually? Uh, I still approach, and this would go on forever, Paul, uh, approach my paintings pretty much as I did when I was working with the Schmier. Uh The last painting is probably dictates what the next one is going to be, going to do. That's that process, you know, from one to the next, and it occurs for a form of an evolution. But uh, it's a matter of going through the process of bringing in fairly uh, a few elements and then dropping in a few more things. I always feel painting needs, and this may be hard to understand, four or five hits. No. So to speak, four or five different uh, 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 decisions that you make on the surface uh, with some artists who are minimalists, and you've probably heard that term both in music and in art and in literature, it even appears now, whereby uh, two or three decision times, that's it, uh, when the artist uh, is over. With my work, it always goes, I think, further. That takes me out of that range of being able to call it minimal. Like chapters started. in a book, it's our stages. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That are high yeah. points yeah. that yeah. the painting are doing. Well, yeah, you develop your, your, your picture and then you start to embellish it. Uh -huh. Or what I call finesse it. And the embellishment are the stages that you're describing. Here. Yeah, the, next, the, the last few, few decisions are either will make or break it. Does a painting ever start out to be one thing and end up being something completely almost different? Only when I just, only when I wreck it, only when I lose it. <laughs> and that's when I rip it off the, uh, and I do that uh, once or twice a year, Doesn't where I, what I call I lose a painting, where I take it right off the, the canvas. You know when that time has come, huh? Yeah. One thing I might mention, back in those days, you know, we had that full program, yeah. and we had a few faculty. Yeah. The uh, painters and the... Um, uh, studio people were expected to teach art history, and those were the days, you know, where to coats and ties, and uh, right. and uh, even in the studio, you take a coat off, but you wouldn't take your tie off. We're dressed today. So that was yeah. that's right. Uniform. That was the uh, what they called the the uh, mutual of Omaha <laughs> mentality. But anyway, I taught all the art histories except uh, Oriental and medieval, and the only reason I didn't teach medieval. Uh, was that was Blackwell's specialty, mm -hmm. and uh, then when Tom Majeski came five years after I got here, he had to, he had to take over the Renaissance, and that of course would be interesting for you to talk to Tom and about his experiences in the in Renaissance art history as well as the humanities lectures that we were asked to give, and that's like throwing a Christian into into the lion's den or in in the Colosseum. You get involved with Dr. Payne in those days? Oh yeah, early on, and then Wardle after that, <coughs> and you can imagine a painter. Through the fire. A painter uh, having to talk to all those people. I felt that uh, I had done art more harm than any good, even though one time I got an applause. Hey. Now, I don't know what that was for. I was either that they were so glad I was done. Uh, Except that a place better so, being great. Yeah, and those are those $50 extra yeah. lectures. Did, Little uh, fees that one could pick up in the uh, day. Well, that's right. And the summer school days were the days where, or, those were to pay my insurance. Uh -huh. And I taught summer school for 13. Sort of to make it. You did 13 something. years, yeah. And I taught one art history and one studio. Uh -huh. That way I'd save a little time. Because, you know, those are those five-week long sessions yeah, I remember. And uh, they used to try to pack in 15 weeks and five weeks to drive you. I haven't done that in a long time. I don't know how, how they can handle that. No, it's, it's, uh, summer school was a sort of a specialty item in some areas. Yeah, they were. Lab work, it was ghastly often, wasn't it? And, and the creative areas, too. Of course, we were the only air conditioned campus, you know, oh, in, in this part of the world. And that building was cold, <laughs> if you remember. I, one thing now I'd like to ask you, Peter. Uh, over the years, along with the students, and you talked about your own work a bit, uh, I'd like to have you talk about some other things, like the people around you. All these years you've been here, any interesting stories and people that stand out in memory you want to put on our shirt? Okay, uh, the introduction of life drawing. Oh, yeah, that's not yeah. interesting. Uh, right, it was the, it's a natural. Life drawing for me is the Latin of art. Mm -hmm. it, it, it goes back to that, that uh, course, remember I took in uh, anatomy. Oh, yeah. That's you know, where you wonder why we're doing it. As a matter of fact, uh, I wrote the syllabus for the life drawing here. And we just introduced it 
uh, and we in those days, you know, and they still do. The syllabus go before a committee, and they look at it very carefully. And one of the considerations uh, was the fact that uh, this course be uh, responsible, because because after all, there were, there were nudes involved, you know. At Albion College, we coped with nudes with leotards, <laughs> and uh, that was the way that was done at that time. Well, I approached it like uh, like the course I had in anatomy, and wrote the syllabus as someone who would be studying anatomy almost on a clinical standpoint, uh, really what would be considered a kinesiology course, I think, in, the, in uh, health education. But anyway. Uh, we got the course through, uh, and uh, there were two questions asked at one time. They wondered how appropriate we, it would be for nudes to be around uh, in the daytime. That was one thing. And then the other thing was that the archdiocese office, you know where it was at one time? Was, it was, still is over there, and then the bishop was living right across the way. Whether or not that was appropriate for this nude to be so close.